Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. Let's shut up and grab some tape. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome into the Film Guy Network on a fabulous Thursday evening. Hey, we got a saying around here when we get around this time, right? Hours five and six of the off-season slate. Hey, last show, best show. We do indeed have a loaded one for you. But hey, want to start with this right here, consistency. It's like the word we, I think we talk most about on this program. It's honestly the only thing we kind of demand and the only thing we ask for, right, is consistency. That's all we ever ask for around here. As long as I know you to be consistent, I am good, right? If I can predict uh, or at least think where you might be going next or what you might be doing, or as long as your decisions and your actions fall in line with your previous thoughts and actions, then I'm good, right? As long as there is a consistent and methodical approach about what it is that you are doing, I am good. And uh, there's one thing that there's a lot to be said about Deion Sanders, right? But there's one thing you have to say about him, right? He is consistently and unapologetically himself, okay, at all times. Now, he may be really loud while doing so. He may be really, really um, prime timey flary while doing so, right? But he is going to be 100% consistently himself. Uh, and he's been very, very open and honest about their approach towards roster acquisition, roster retention, and particularly their approach towards the transfer portal. There has been no uh, shade or no bones made about the fact that they are very open about their willingness to be kind of anointed as you know transfer portal you they are the the roster and the football program that is absolutely out here being a revolving door and being about being the revolving door okay out here in the transfer portal market so when i look on uh you know social media right and i see social media and instagram and twitter everybody freaking out about shiloh sanders going to his instagram story and basically running a an ad if you will, for Colorado football saying, hey, if you're in the portal, come on, hit us up. We, we will more than likely, okay, listen, or we will at least talk to you, right? Um, come hang out. Come come talk to us. Come come see what this is about. Look, man, everybody went on to, to Twitter and did the, uh, you know, jokes and stuff. But honestly, this checked out to me. This looks like everything that they're about. This is everything that they have made themselves to be about with regards to roster acquisition. This is who they are going to be. This is how they, uh, you know, have built this roster. And honestly, it's probably, I wouldn't say this is the exact way that I would go about redoing the Colorado roster, but I think sometimes we forget just how bad they were, just how bad Colorado football was prior to Deion Sanders getting there, and just how far they still have left to go, right? Um, people thought this made them look like a second-rate football program that is taking recyclables. Yeah, that's what they are. They're a second-rate football team that needs to take the recyclables from the first-rate football teams or the first-rate football players that are on second-rate football programs, and they need to bring them to Colorado to make that a better football program. Yeah, all the jokes that were made about them being, you know, this football program that is uh, talent-hungry or in need of better football players are constantly – yeah – that's exactly what they have always been, or that's exactly what they have been out on the forefront. And by the way, I thought Dion's comments in the in the, in the media were exactly kind of in line with this thought process, right? He said, "quote uh, talking directly to the haters." So when he says they. He's talking about the haters. They don't know how this stuff works, okay? Let's get this straight. When real players want to jump, they can't talk to personnel, right? So who do you talk to? You talk to the players. How stupid are you to think that they don't talk to one another? That's when you know who's who and what's what. That's where it comes from first. Like, if I know who's going to jump into the portal from our team, what are my players going to tell me, okay? Not, I, not a coach from somewhere else because it's legal, correct? 
correct? Uh, for the coach to be having these conversations, or it's illegal, excuse me, for the coach to be having these conversations, although they happen. But when Shiloh says this, he's not lying. So basically what he's saying right there is, I'm not allowed to talk to these guys. I'm not allowed to figure out whether or not they want to go in the portal. I'm not the one that's allowed to be having these conversations, but ain't nothing stopping for my son from talking to Alabama's backup corner and saying, hey, do you like it down there? There ain't nothing in the rules stopping Shiloh Sanders from doing that, and there's nothing in the rules from stopping players that are currently on active rosters elsewhere from reaching out to the Sanders boys saying, hey, what do y'all have going on up there, or what can y'all have done or or make done for me? Hmm. I've never even thought about it being something of the players talking to other players. And like, do you think it seriously is just like, say a player talks to Shadur and says like, oh hey, like I'm thinking about coming there, and then Shadur is like supposed to go to Dion and say like, hey, so and so saying he might want to come here. Ain't nothing stopping from it happening. And honestly, it's it's a really really good loophole. And it's a loophole that is really only mm-hmm. provided to the Sanders family. Unless there's somebody on your roster that you can talk to uh, from a player to co- or a coach to player standpoint, which I wouldn't be surprised if this is happening elsewhere. Yeah. Right. Especially like, for example, when Caleb Williams was at USC, I guarantee Lincoln Riley and him were in communications with who they thought was the best player in the, in the portal or the best player that they wanted to get into the portal. And all that would require was, hey, once you once you send so and so a message, now these weren't text messages, right? You would imagine this is Lincoln calling, right? In this example, this would be Lincoln calling a player, saying, "Hey, go find out about that other player because I can't do so." Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's also instances where you have player X talking to player Y at another school who says, "Hey, you know, I don't really like the situation I'm in," and then that player goes and talks to his coach, like, "Hey, coach, we've got this guy over here who's kind of saying that, you know." I, I, I'm not happy here. But, I mean, there's also – we know tampering exists in college football. So, Dion could also just be giving you lip service here with saying, no, I don't tamper. My son goes out and does this for me because there's no rule against that when in reality he could very well be tampering. He went on to say it's how it goes down and he's just making a joke out of it really. That's hilarious, but that's really how it goes. Now go look at Shadur's DMs and you're like, oh, my God, every wide receiver, tight end, and offensive lineman in the country is in there. Every <laughs> single one, huh? Every single one. Now look – I, I am I would implore my most popular and most like no, well known football player on my roster moving forward as this like liaison recruiter like type guy if this is really what's happening like this is the loophole to get around tampering now here's what I'm gonna tell you about it you don't need no loophole ain't nobody running down the 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 uh, worst tamperers out here in the sport right, right. Uh, ain't nobody nobody went after Texas when they magically got ad Mitchell from Georgia last year in like a blink of an eye right no no one's looking into these things uh, I would imagine during this week of NCAA and I'm not accusing nobody of nothing but Florida State is supposed to be under a uh, sanction right now or they are not allowed Allowed to recruit in the portal now is that maybe part of the reason why we haven't seen any activity or a ton of activity because one of the biggest spenders and one of the biggest portal university power five football programs is currently supposed to be sitting on their hands now magically in a couple of days when their sanction is up do we start seeing players hit the portal maybe do we start do we do we think florida state's gonna go portalless this spring my answer would be no okay so Again, no no one's actually enforcing these rules, but I, I'm with the, hey, look, man, like, this is who we are. This is what mm-hmm. we're going to do. Yeah, I mean, like you said, you've got to respect Dion for one thing that's consistency. I know most of the nation, or at least a good bit of it, doesn't agree with the way he does things, and it kind of irks people and he rubs people the wrong way. But like you said, he has been who he's been for the last for his entire football career before I, even I was alive. So he is Dion. He is who he is, and he does things a certain way that – might rub you the wrong way, but he doesn't give a damn. I think good. I think that college football fans should really <laughs> appreciate Deion Sanders because I know that he can rub people the wrong way, and you may not take him seriously or whatever else. But I think that college football fans should really appreciate him because I think that one thing Deion brings that you probably don't get anywhere else in college football is that. He's going to be abruptly honest with you. He's going to tell you how things are. He's not going to yeah. BS you, the bull junk in you or anything like that. He's going to tell you exactly how things are, like Dion telling that his kids are recruiting people or that um, – what was the other thing that he talked about that I just had in my mind that I'm blinking on right now? Or, or, which schools or which teams his son will play for? Yeah, those things like that. Or the Kamani McLean thing. Like yeah. A lot of coaches would give you a whole lot of lip service there, but he told you, like, well, this is what he has to do. And like when he does that, we will be more than happy to give him playing time on Saturday. Like Look. That, 
I appreciate that. I, I'm not saying I would run my program like Deion Sanders, but I'm not freaking Deion Sanders. Nope. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's only one person that gets to walk around this planet with the name Deion Sanders and the clout that he gets to walk around with, and he'll have that the rest of his life. Um, I've always been under the impression that Dion is at Colorado for the length of his son's careers. Was that you guys' kind of impression? Yeah, that's what it felt like. I don't think that's the impression that I get anymore. Hmm. Um, And we'll talk a little bit about that moving forward. But based off the conversations that I've been having, there are really, really big recruits that are still listening to Dion Sanders and looking at him as a – Nah, he's going to be there for a little minute. Hmm. So this is going to be something it sounds like we're going to be uh, talking about for quite some time. Uh, and I, I'm with y'all. I think it's good for college football in the sense that this is a coach that is going to provide us something we can actually talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, we're gonna, we get to talk about Kamani McClain because he didn't just circle around it, right? He, right. Didn't, he didn't give us some coach speak. He gave us the real, this guy didn't do X, Y, and Z for me. He was never going to play here. Yeah, and I mean, as appealing and, and as great, Great and as much as you need a Kirby Smart and a Nick Saban to run the e- elite of elite up echelon programs, to the casual fan, having a college football coach where the name is recognizable and they're boisterous and they talk a certain way and they're they're very opinionated in what they do, like it's very good for bringing bringing the people to the sport, having people watch it. Like the Colorado Colorado State game last year was one of the most watched games I've seen in a minute. So, bro, you getting cooked? F- no, friendly fire in the chat. Very fat shell. Dude, I'm just listing names. I'm not calling you that. It's a new trend now. It's a new trend. Is that, that, is that be, not honest, what we're honestly? It might be one of the better ones. You know, Terry Bradshaw. Yeah, oh, I got it. Very fat show. Yeah, I got the joke. I Thank thought you. not bad. I thought it just turned into. I mean, it it started out as whatever name you had for yourself, and then it kind of evolved into how many names can you make about fat quarterbacks? So we're going on. Like it's not directed two at, weeks of this. It's not directed at you. It's not directed at of me. Of course not. But it started directed at me. Yeah, I guess so. It's fair. I didn't start it, though. Welcome into tonight's show. We do indeed have a loaded one for you. Uh, The latest names in the transfer portal, uh, it's getting there. It's getting there. We're starting to see a little bit more action uh, in the coming days, or excuse me, in the most recent days. Michigan's first NCAA uh, NCAA punishment has been handed down. Uh, It's kind of a moot point, but there is some interesting reporting going on in that one that we felt need uh felt the need to talk to you guys about tonight uh penn state's fans okay penn state's fans seem to have had enough okay based off some things that i saw today thought that was worth talking about there's a steve sarkeesian story out there and dylan riola has made the show notes again today okay but hey first things first want to make sure you guys hit that thumbs up button like subscribe rate review and make sure you're running over to prizepicks.com using promo code brooks and getting that 100 percent deposit match over there what does that mean you put up to 100 dollars, you'll get matched with 100 dollars instantly right there in your account I, i i it has to be allergies at this point but it is we are into the point now where we're like seven hours of content this week Mm -hmm. and three of that was just me talking Mm -hmm. and i'm cooked boys are you a sleep screamer (laughs) i feel that way sometimes good god you just just scream in your sleep just scream in your sleep yeah i don't know i feel sorry for your wife if you professional diagnosis for it but you gotta get on that claritin bro yeah something like that um top names in the portal it's still look i i did the i need to take this Okay. Top names in the portal. Well, I guess the biggest one that just recently, I mean, literally hit right before the show was Jaden Rashada. Mm-hmm. That's a kid that was originally committed to Florida, got out of his NLI, and then he eventually ended up at Arizona State, and now he's in the portal. Got to be the best quarterback in this transfer class now. I mean, biggest name for sure that's entered um, for quarterbacks, and maybe in the class entirety. Um, so that was the biggest one for yeah. sure. My question for this is, does he expect to start wherever he goes? And I mean, it, it, obviously he's leaving for a certain reason. Like he he wants either more time, he wants more reps, more money. Maybe what school is in a position right now where it's like we desperately need a starting quarterback and we're willing to fork out this kind of money at this point of the season? Yeah, I mean that's the whole conversation about this transfer portal window is <laughs> it's kind of hard to find immediate playing time at this point, especially for a position like quarterback. Like you got to think that. People already kind of have their depth chart lined up. Now, there are some emergency situations where a team probably is definitely interested in Rashada and mm-hmm. would start him in a heartbeat this fall. 
Y'all talking Jaden Rashada? Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking Jaden Rashada too. Um, oh. So Jaden Rashada going to enter the portal. That I don't know if that's beneficial. Uh, he has announced that he's going to do so. His reports are out. Yeah. Um, I'm told when he's officially in the portal, uh, I don't know about other schools, the University of Georgia will at some point contact him. Yeah, I actually just sent you guys a text message of that same thing, of Georgia's like the top interested school. Yes, that that was the phone call. Uh, I just got. What's, what does a guy like Jaden Rashada get from going to the – like the prospect of, hey, next year you could be the guy? Because obviously this 2024 is Carson Beck's year. Like you're not going to come in in the spring and take over that starting job. Not from the guy who's the lead or the highest odds in the Heisman. Yeah, so if you're Jaden Rashada – now I'm not saying this is how this went down, but let's be honest. Went to Florida for a pretty historic dollar amount, right? Mm-hmm. Transferred to Arizona State for a pretty good dollar amount, you would imagine, right? So your first two college decisions were made off of where can I go get some money? Your your third and hopefully final college decision needs to make, be made solely off of development. Where, where can I go where I know I'm going to be, A, protected, B, in a situation where I'm going to succeed, and C, developed into an NFL talent? So this is kind of get the bag, get the bag, now let's focus on the career so we can have a long, a, a high draft pick in the NFL. So basically. long, a, the long game. Yeah, the long play. NFL over NIL, right? Mm-hmm. Something we've talked about on this channel for a long time. Um but we've also been telling you guys for a while that they were they were going to get into the market for a a fourth you know scholarship quarterback. Rashada certainly fits the mold. The interesting thing about this was I don't know how uh, interested both parties were with him coming out of high school. You know, like that, it's obviously a highly touted football player, a guy that they were made aware of, but. I mean, even like the offer history, does he even have a high school offer from Georgia? Will you look that up for me? Um, This wasn't a name during his recruitment process that I think they even had a real shot at because of some of the dollar amount asking prices. So this would be same class as Gunner, right? Uh, No, this would be 2023 or 2020. Yeah, 2023. 2023, I believe. Okay. This would have been the – no, this would have been – it says in 247 is 2023. Okay, 2023. Okay. Yeah, that would have been the Arch Manning class. Gotcha. So, would have made sense why they punted on him then because they were going after um, going after Manning. I don't yeah. see any offers from Georgia on <laughs> Yeah. You would imagine Rashada has three years left of college eligibility. Mm-hmm. He might have four depending on how many games he played this year because he got hurt early. Yeah. He's not a COVID prospect, so – what quarterback has Kirby Smart developed into a legit NFL prospect? Well, his starter currently is going to be a first-round draft pick, uh, and he took a walk-on and turned him into a fourth-round draft pick? Yep. yep. Okay. <laughs> I think we can move on with that one. Yeah. Um, I mean, and if you think about it, that's two for three. Yeah, I mean, like, Jake, like, Fr- Jake, Jake Fromm didn't. Jake Fromm was Jake to, Fromm. Yeah. But other than that, like, rankings. you can't really count Jacob Eason as a Kirby Smart quarterback. Mm-hmm. Dwan Mathis, no. Like, Kirby Smart's had three true quarterbacks during his, his tenure, which is impressive because he's been a coach for eight years. It's been Jake Fromm, Stetson Bennett, and now it's Carson Beck. That's not a bad run. No. Not at all. What so. other big names would you classify for this transfer portal opening? Um, there's not many. So I, I looked at it today. Uh, and now, Jane Rashada has moved this around just a little bit. But uh, 24-7 has the, the college uh, transfer portal available right there, all the names that have been in. And they will rank them, you mm-hmm. know, based off how they have, you know, put a uh, ambiguous number scale on these guys, right? So I went through the top 100 players that have become available in the portal from December's window to this window that has just come open, right? So all of the players ranked one through 100, top 100 players. Do you know how many of those 100 players have entered this April? I'm going to guess. You had to guess. I'm going to guess it's probably less seven. than 15. Less than 15 and seven. There is eight. Mm. Okay. Eight of the top 100 players that have entered the portal since December have entered this window. So 92% of the best transfers are already gone. Okay. They, they, they transferred December, found a new home. And now we're looking at eight names in the top 100. You will make this nine now with Rashada, right? It's Caden Proctor, who really doesn't count. No. Okay. It's, uh, 
Zadamella, the freshman that transferred out of USC. That sounded, based off everything that I've heard of, is that USC might have paid him a little bit too much, uh, realized they missed, and basically rescinded the offer as soon as the kid got on campus and they evaluated him. Cormani McLean. I would say that basically the same thing happened to Colorado, but from a playing uh, uh, time standpoint. So there's that. Damian Martinez, good football player. Head coach left out there at Oregon State. He's going to find a new home. He's going to be an impactful player wherever he ends up, right? Sam Brown, a Houston wide receiver, was ranked in the top 100 here. Don't know where he's going to end up transferring. Jackson Howard was a top-ranked edge rusher coming out of high school. Has struggled, I believe, with some injury concerns at LSU. He's in the portal. Jacoby Matt. Matthews, former five-star safety, probably going to end up at Oregon, it sounds like, coming out of Texas A&M. He's in the portal. Outside of that, man, it's it's not a lot of big names. There's two names that kind of gained some steam today. Uh, Demonic. Demonic? De- Dame. Dominic? Dominic. I think it's, spelled a, if it's Damon a, Ick. Mm. Damon Ick. That's why I read it, Demonic. Mm. Um, one more time on that one? Dominic. Dominic. But it's spelled Dam- Damonic. Did Real you, weird. Did you spell it wrong? Dominic or? Williams. No, I didn't. D A M O N I C. Dominic Williams, the defense attack out of TCU. Sounds like uh, he's already narrowed his list despite entering like within the last 24 hours. It's uh, o- Oklahoma, Texas, Colorado, LSU, Missouri, and Oregon. That screams Midwest plus money equals transfer destination. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of what's going on there. Another name to kind of pay attention to, particularly here in the Georgia space, a uh, guy by the name of Simeon Barrow Jr. Uh, Michigan State defensive tackle, but the biggest name so far, Jaden Rashada, who, by the way, looked really, really good mm-hmm. in the limited time he played this year uh, behind a very, very porous offensive line. Yeah. yeah, he was at the Elite 11. Were you there for that year? Yeah, I was. Mm. He got it. He got, he got a live arm. Okay, really twitchy. Seems like there's a lot of D linemen in this. Uh, it seems like the market for defensive linemen has been uh, the one that's getting money spent on it or at least there are national championship caliber rosters that are shy of defensive tackles okay um and that that's why i think we're seeing this i think another houston defensive tackle yep. entered the portal today and that that's kind of what the spring portal has seen mostly about mid majors or borderline mid major programs who have all conference caliber players searching higher platforms and more money that's what it seems like to me. And, and I know the defensive tackle market is rather uh, thin and rosters are thin at the position based off comments that I've heard from other coaches around the country. Prime example, Kirby, Kirby mentioned the other day, you know, there, there are rosters in this in this conference, talking about the SEC, that don't even have a 300-pounder on their defensive line. Jeez. So it, it's, it's become a really thin spot across the sport. So, yeah, if you're someone that is really, really talented, has played well the first three years of your college career at a smaller school, you can get a check this round. Is it also a position you think where it's I, – I feel like it's one of the few positions in football where there's more depth than usual. Like you can rotate five guys on a defensive line. You might be able yeah. to rotate five receivers, but it's five different style of receivers where defensive linemen are, are more – obviously you have nose tags and threes and such as that, but defensive linemen, are you can kind of – Put them in where you want. Yeah, de- interior defensive line and edge rushers are, are positions where you can never have enough. Okay, like as That's long as the guy's good, we I mean, dude twenty snaps for a defensive lineman can change the game. Right. You know what I mean? 20 fresh ones. Yeah. Get him out there. Let him play as hard as he can for 20 snaps. He can impact the football game and walk away having everyone think, God dang, so-and-so changed the game today. When in reality, he played a quarter of the snaps. Mm-hmm. Like that. That's the reality of that position. Uh, and you've seen Super Bowl teams kind of model their roster all, a- after this, right? <clears throat> the Eagles most noticeably. Yeah. Okay. They're a, a roster that's just like, oh, Best player available right now in the drafts, an edge rusher. We got four of them on our roster. Who cares? We might need a fifth. You know, like that, that's the kind of way that they're going down these roads sometimes. Hmm. So, yeah, you can never have enough. Never have enough. But that that is the market that is kind of quote unquote exploded. So there's that. Uh, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Okay, bunch of people in here watching tonight. We appreciate you for being here. If you have not already, subscribe to the channel. Okay, we have statistics on these things. 
about one out of every five of you guys that show up every single night aren't subscribed. So let's Ooh. change that a little bit. Y'all get in there, just crossed over 22,000. So a little golf clap for the Brodies right there. Um, yeah, good stuff, good work right there. Continuing, continuing to grow and uh, get better around here despite the fact that your boy's voice wants to tap the hell out. Just hang in there, man. You got another hour and 35. You can do it. Yeah, I got it. And no rest for the weary. Um, speaking of resting, some show cause orders. Mm. I don't know if that's a transition, but some coaches are going to be taking some resting time away from the sport. Was that, was that, that, does that yeah, work? That works. that works. All right. Um, so if you watched uh, the Twitter timeline today, shouldn't have any static. Uh, if you watched the Twitter timeline today, you probably saw something pop up about uh, Michigan receiving sanctions from the NCAA or receiving some type of penalty from the NCAA. And your first thought was probably, oh, we probably got stallions. Some, yeah, we got some stallions. We got some sign stealing coming down. Nope. Nope. That would not be it. Um, this is actually still stemming from the cheeseburger incident. Okay, this is still stemming from the COVID uh, improper contact period back from 2020. So this is a four-year-old investigation. And the headline out of this is that five coaches were given their punishment. And one coach, however, did not agree to those terms. Got any ideas on who that one coach just, might be? Just flat Maybe out said the no. coach that just left for an NFL job? Yeah, one, one coach just flat out said, ah, I'm not accepting that. Y'all can keep investigating me. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to take a guess. Take a quick gander. Likes to wear khakis. Lives yeah. And, lives in and an RV. You know what? Not a terrible guess because they kind of give it away. Now, I'm not saying they 100% give it away, but if you actually do the reading, and again, I read because I know you don't. Um, if you read the actual report and release statement that came out from the NCAA today, you will find this. Quote, the negotiated resolution also involved the school's agreement that the underlying violations demonstrated a head coach's responsibility violation and the former football coach failed to meet his responsibilities to cooperate with the investigation the school also agreed that uh it failed to deter and detect the impermissible recruiting contacts and did not ensure that the football program adhered to rules for non-coaching staff members and they continue the committee will not discuss further details in the case to protect the integrity of the ongoing process as the committee's final decision including potential violations and penalties for the former coach are still pending so the investigation isn't done because they haven't, you know, actually given out penalties to the head coach because one of the coaches basically said, I'm not accepting those penalties. Hmm. So Harbaugh, I hear still dicking the uh, NCAA around a little bit. Hypothetically, said coach mm. who is not at the school anymore, why does it matter if you accept the sanctions or not? I, I don't think said coach has any intentions at returning to college football anytime soon. Would you say that? Then said coach, in this case Jim Harbaugh, is just laughing like a cartoon character running away from a stick of dynamite that he stuck in a, a rabbit hole. Like he just <laughs> just running off to the NFL because they'll never get him. They're, they're not getting him on this 2020 shit. By the way, uh, does anyone think they'll come to the conclusion of this sign stealings investigation before the NCAA is actually blown to smithereens? Heck no. No, probably not. I mean, let's see. It took three years to figure out a cheeseburger three and a scandal. Half. It's, I would say the sign stealing one's probably, what, three times as big of a deal as the cheeseburger one. So it's probably going to take, what, nine years for this to be done? Yeah. You think the NCAA is going to be around in nine years? No, I'm, I'm calling dubious on that one. Yeah, I don't think so. Hmm. Or at least it's not going to have any power to do anything. So what exactly does it, which I may just be misreading something, but why does it just say three years of probation? Probation of what? Just like you can't be a college football coach? You can't. Well, here, hold on. I have the actual sanctions right here. Again, I do the reading, so you don't have to. The agreed upon penalties in this case include three years of probation for the school. Doesn't say what the probation means. Yeah. A fine and recruiting restrictions in alignment with level one mitigated classification for the school. The participating individuals also agreed, agreed to a one, sh one year show cause order consistent with the level two standards and level two mitigated classifications of their respective violations. Um, 
Don't know what that means. Yeah. Don't don't know I, what probation okay. means. Okay. That's this, what I took away from it, and I just want to make sure I wasn't crazy. Could that be said coach sticking up for the coach he left behind? Like, I got you. I'm going to do this. That way you don't have to deal with the fallout of whatever this ridiculous investigation is, this witch hunt. I mean, is that? do you think that's him, like, trying to look out for Sharon Moore? Oh, I don't think Jim Harbaugh gives a shit about Sharon Moore. Okay. Now, based off his actions, right? Right. There is nothing that Jim Harbaugh has done to make G- a Sharon Moore's job anything but more difficult. It's it's like one of the hardest transitional periods of any head coach I've seen in recent memory. Where it's like, not only am I going to leave your roster completely gutted and just dip out after you lose 25 seniors or whatever it was, but also, by the way, I'm going to leave you with all the sanctions. And also, by the way, I'm going to tear like five of your best assistants off your staff. Yeah. Is this the hardest transition to make since Bill O'Brien at Penn State? No, no Jeff, I- Jeff Collins switching from the triple to a regular mm. offense. Really? Uh, yeah, dude. I, I, it's the last one we'll see in Power 5 football because they were the last team to do it. I cannot express to you how hard it is to go from we are running an offense that was created before World War One to now we're actually going to play real modern football and just how different your roster acquisition strategies have to become. Yeah. You literally go from trying to stack an offensive line that looks like this where your center is the biggest player on your team to where you're – tackles basically look like extended tight ends to now we're trying to find six foot seven tackles down to really athletic centers it's like that's just one position group too you know what i mean it's it's a total flip so I, jeff collins is not a good football coach jeff collins also would have never figured that one out yeah so i and i i said that when he was there i think it was one of my like first national opinions was hey this is really hard to do so even though he's a goofball sipping waffle house coffee and doing curls on the sideline and wearing (laughs) shirts that are too tight this is really hard to do um so no I i think that was way way harder i wonder if this was harbaugh's plan of moving into an rv so that if the NCAA wants to come knocking on his door, he just go parks it out in the desert for a few days. It's like, can't come, catch me. Come find me. You think you think yeah. Harbaugh's a fugitive from the NCAA? Yeah, I think he is. He's a runaway. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he has to run too hard, man, to be honest with you. Again, uh, I, think, I think he is laughing like a little school child uh, at this idea that the NCAA is going to chase him for the rest of their existence, which, again, I don't know how much longer it's yeah. going to be around to even – be doing this stuff um so there's that um no no shot no shot they actually get the sign stealing investigation done before they're cooked themselves um should we talk about drew hour i feel like we've been trying to talk about drew hour for a couple of days now the grace of god has been protecting him <clears throat> the spring game looked atrocious did we talk about this the other day no how no, bad yeah. was it truly? Do you have the stats for me? Wasn't it like less than 45% completion percentage? I think he was 13 for 28 or something like that. Oh. Maybe even worse than that. It I may thought have been it was like, 14 for 35. That, that yeah. sounds more accurate. Yeah. Oh. It was horrible. So, Drew Aller for Heisman? pull him up. I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. I call everybody else out for it, so I'm going to call it right now. Um this Georgia to Rashada news happened like that. Buddy ain't even officially in it, and everybody's like, hey, watch out for Georgia. Do you think that's in product just because Kirby Smart has like, gone publicly, very publicly saying, like, we want a fourth quarterback? Even this show has been like, hey, yeah. they're going to take a fourth quarterback. Yeah, they are going to take a fourth quarterback, and they were going to take a fourth quarterback, and they need a fourth, a fourth quarterback. But, like, the immediate linking to this was like – I mean, it, it was fo- it was followed up in tweets, like as he was announced right. entering the portal. I'm just saying, when this stuff happens to Georgia players, like I mentioned earlier, Ad Mitchell, nobody called about it. You got to be honest. You you got to be very you know be very forthcoming with it. Like, hey, this is obvious right here, right? Yeah, it feels very obvious. Okay, so don't ever call me biased. Don't ever call Brooksy the Homer. Okay, because. I just pointed it out. It's very obvious that this was uh, something that they probably pushed for. Mm. Well, here's our stats. It was 15 of 32 mm. on the day. So it was less than 50%. Yeah. And I wonder how many of those 15 completions were at near or behind the line of scrimmage. Well, and not only that, like if you go back and watch like the highlight clip that's been floating around on Twitter, like at one point in the game, he was, I want to say like 8 for 11. And then I think he probably had like 15 straight incompletions, it seemed like. 
just couldn't even connect with anybody. Yeah, the highlights were really, really atrocious. Yeah, it wasn't either just like hitting some fingertips or anything like that. It was like five yard overthrows, ten yards into the out of bounds area. It was very, very bad. You think they missed Sean Clifford? God, he was there for like a decade. Sean Clifford that, Hackenberg was that the other kid's name? Uh, it was Christian, Christian, Hackenberg. Christian Hackenberg. Those were not the same person. I know. But they looked identical. No, yeah. I knew it wasn't the same person. You know they missed the goat though. Mick Sorley. Trace Trace still out here trying out for the league. You know, he was you, up there in Indy, uh, throwing at the combine. Him and Kellen Mond. You can say what you want though about like those three quarterbacks. Like they were good college quarterbacks, if you want to call it that. But I mean, they 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 weren't this bad. Like what Aller was last year, especially in those big games for Penn State. Like at least in those big games, it seemed like Clifford or McSorley or Hackenberg like were at least manageable. Whereas this, it feels like it's going in the opposite direction. Like the beginning of last year for Penn State, it seemed like Aller was going to be a very viable option for them moving forward. And that maybe with some more development over the years that he would become one of the college football's best quarterbacks. But this feels like it's backtracking. It's going the opposite direction for him. This is an impromptu question that I just thought of, but who's under more pressure this year? You think James Franklin or Ryan Day? Because if Ryan Day doesn't win a national title with this, I mean, you're under a you're under you're on the hot seat pretty much. Yeah. But if James Franklin doesn't even make a playoff, like, does he have a job at Penn State next year? Who who would Penn State hire? That's my whole thing. Like yeah, like you, you can always make that. You know, like who would they hire? But at some point, the universe, like you said, the fan base and the university is going to be like, all right, we've done what ten years of this, and it's time to we haven't had any results. But if if he loses to like a close game and then loses to Ohio State, I think that fan base would be at least honest with themselves about losing to a thirty million dollar roster. Yeah, when they don't spend but, it like that. But like if you go. Nine and three, and you don't make the playoff at all in a twelve-team format. Yeah, I, I just personally think right now is the last time, or the last time in college football that you need to be firing a coach if you're not spending massive money. That's fair. He can only do so much. You know what I mean? Now you can you can criticize James Franklin for the lack of development from Drew Aller. You can 100% do that, whether you want to blame it on that he didn't surround him with good enough uh, coordinating or whether he didn't hasn't surrounded him enough with good enough players or whatever it is. There has been a lack of development here. But my question and the whole reason we're talking about this is because I looked I, f- I found some Penn State social media stuff today of, you know, kind of like highlights of Drew Auer throwing and the backup throwing. And, dude, you pull up – and I know it's it's social media, but it is a temperature at some point of the fan base, particularly on their comments. You look through the comments, it's like backup needs a spot, hours trash, yada, yada, yada. And all of the engagement is like anti-Drew Hour deep state right now at Penn mm-hmm. State. And my question to you guys is like how much does it really matter if you lose the fan base? I think it doesn't matter at all. Like okay. you're, you're seeing, you're kind of seeing this at Florida right now, where it seems like every day Florida fans lose faith in Billy Napier. And I mean, we've essentially said he's a dead man walking into the 2024 season just because simply one, the media is not behind you, the fan base isn't behind you, things such as that. Like, if your fan base doesn't support you, it's likely that your boosters don't support you, who are in turn fans of the school. Where if you don't have the fan base support, the boosters then feel that and they're going to start pulling out dollars and then all of a sudden like the university has to make a move i think it all depends on your cred like your cred as a head coach like if if you earn the right to go against the grain of what your fan base says and like however many there are disagreeing with your decisions i think there's a handful of them that have kind of earned this cred maybe not even a handful maybe a few of them in college football right now that could really do this and go completely against what everybody in the fan base wants but I think of the fan base temperature and like how they're feeling towards some of your decisions and if they're wanting the backup, I think that stuff does ultimately matter. Because, I mean, you could say that coaches don't listen to the fan base or players block out the noise or whatever. Like, you can feel that. You can always feel like when a fan base is turning against someone or turning against your team, and that has an effect on your program. Yeah, I was more thinking about it from like a quarterback's perspective. Like, when the fan base thinks that the other guy, the, the guy you're starting is not the guy, how quickly are you to listen to that fan base? And, and maybe it's not even the fan base anymore. You hit the nail on the head. It's the boosters, right? Like mm-hmm. we're, we're at a point in time in college football where your salary is being paid by your fan base and by your, your highest, you know, donating boosters. So if Booster Johnny calls and Booster Johnny gives 
fifteen percent of your payroll every month. And he says, I think Drew Hours sucks, and I'm not giving you any more money until you think about playing the other guy. By God, you're thinking about playing the other guy. Where right. in the NFL, if the starter sucks, all the head coach has to answer to is his locker room, right? Making sure he's doing right by those guys, giving them the best chance to win, and his owner. And that's it. And nowadays in college football, you have a large number of people who are literally invested in your program and they help pay your salaries. So you kind of have to answer to these people to an extent. To some degree. I think it all depends on how strong you are as a coach and a player and how much you believe in yourself and what you do. We saw this two years ago with... And what your track record is. Yeah, but with, I mean, we saw this two years ago with Kirby Smart and Stetson Bennett. Like People were calling for JT Daniels to take over at any point in the season, and especially after Georgia lost to Alabama in the SEC Championship. But Kirby Smart stayed strong with him. I mean, had he listened to the bo- boosters and things such as that, or the outside noise, does Georgia have a national championship in 2021 or 2022? Like yeah. that's an interesting question to ask. So I think it's there are definitely you definitely feel the pressure of that just because people on the outside who have so much power and so much influence on the success of your program. But I think if you are someone who truly believes in what you're doing as a coach, you'll have to stick to that and you'll you'll die on that hill. I think really the only time where I feel like you see examples of this where maybe a head coach succumbs to what the feeling of the fan base is is when they feel like their job is on the line. Mm. Like I think you could They'll see cook a coordinator. Yeah, like or like I think that is we talk about it all the time with Billy Napier like there might be a point where the season gets so bad that it's going to be well let's at least put DJ Lagway out there and make it seem like something exciting is going on or like we might have something exciting going on for the horizon to where maybe I can keep my job and the fan base stays content even though we're 4 and 8 right now. Just a very very interesting time to be in college football. Um, should we go to the Sark story next? Yeah, yeah. this was Let's really do interesting. It. All right, so Sark basically told ESPN that uh, it, not only was he approached about the Alabama job, but that he seriously considered taking the job, but ultimately turned it down because he feels like he's on the precipice of, and his quotes were, a run of epic proportions at Texas. Thoughts on just that alone? A thought about the Alabama job. Probably you would assume got the phone call first. Most right, likely. To DeBoer, right? No matter how much Bama fans want or Bama leadership wants to tell you they got their guy. They probably called him first and he really had to mull it over. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's Alabama. Like like let's be honest, it's one of the it's one of the most coveted jobs in college football thanks to Nick Saban. So it it makes sense as to why he at least considered it. Mm. I don't know that I agree that they, I feel like Texas is on the cusp of just an absolute run. Was the quote a, epic, a run of epic proportions? It was uh, doing something epic like what they've had, basically. I mean, the, define epic for Texas. Like, I think for Texas, having three or four, 11 and 1, 12 and 0 deep playoff run seasons is epic proportions. It might not end in three or four national titles, but if you think about what Texas has been over the last 15 years, it hasn't been anything where it's like, hey, that's a national powerhouse. Like last year was the first year they even competed for a national title since 2009. Here it is right here. We've poured a ton into this program for three years, and we're on the cusp, I think, of – why is it – man, all these damn ads nowadays on these articles. We've poured a ton into this program for three years, and we're on the cusp, I think, of going on a run that will be epic. I believe that. That's I, I don't hate that. Like you have to get your fan base excited and you have to also say like I think this was more of Sark reassuring the Texas fans, like, yeah, you know, I thought about it, but I believe so much in what the future of this team is that we're gonna do something really special here in the next few years. Like, I understand as to why you have to say epic proportions. Like if you come out and be like Hey, you know, we might be pretty good in the next years. Texas fans aren't gonna be like, what do you mean? We're spending all this money. We just do in the SEC. Like, why are why aren't why aren't the expectations high? Yeah, you, you can't go in front of the microphones and say, I didn't leave because they pay me eleven and a half million dollars a year and it's Texas. Hmm. You can't do that. So yeah, you have to say, I think what we're and Dan Lanning did the same thing, by the way. Mm-hmm. Dan Lanning said they they he feel, he feels that they can do the same thing that everybody thinks you can do at Alabama at Oregon. Like, I think we can do that here, is what he said. I think we can do something special here. And I think you obviously you can do that at Texas, but I just kind of have my questions about Texas moving forward. It's like, 
like you have this year with Quinn Ewers, but I mean, there's questions with the weaponry this year. Like, how is that going to look? Yeah, you added Isaiah Bond, but you also lost two really good wide receivers, two potential first round wide receivers this year. And so I don't think that it's just like easy to sit here and say that Texas is going to go on a run where they win, I don't know, a national title or two over the next four years. I think they, they recruit the way that they recruit with the ability that they could do that. But like you have Quinn Ewers this year. If you don't win it this year, then you got Arch Manning starting his first year of college football. And as great as Arch Manning might be in his first year, I mean, there's still bumps on the road with that. So I just think that there's questions and obviously Sark has to say those things and it's important for him to get belief around the program, but I just have my own questions about Texas moving forward still. I will say this. If anyone knows what it requires or what it looks like to have a roster, a program, a culture, a environment to create a dynasty, it would be the guys who spent the most time around Saban. And I don't know of two active head coaches that spent more time around Saban than Sark and, and uh, Kirby. Mm-hmm. Sark had two stints there, right? Wasn't he a uh, like a, an off the field analyst right after his USC job? Got a job with the Falcons and then came back to be an OC at Alabama. Probably spent five years total in Tuscaloosa, is what I would have to what I would guess. Uh, yes, he was an analyst in 2016. Went to the Falcons and then came back as the OC in 2019 for three seasons, right? 2019 and 2020. That was it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so he, he spent three total years at Alabama. Um, but either way, so, you know, uh, Kirby obviously spent, I think, seven. Was it seven? Like yeah, two thousand at, at Tuscaloosa. 16 to – Plus, well, whatever he spent with Saban and LSU, too. LSU, yeah, too. the Dolphins. The Dolphins. I mean, everywhere. It's been a long time around him. <clears throat> Got a DM right there. I'm going to check that Did later. you see the headline, though? this crazy headline with texas no i didn't you you sent it to Man, me but I thought it's a little wild it read like an april fool's prank i'll tell you that much I, I, let me pull up the exact quote of this headline because i just i read it and i was like there's no way someone wrote this up and sure enough they did and i read a little bit of it and i mean i guess they made somewhat of a case for it but this is the headline arch manning and tim tebow role question mark how texas can maximize potential of star backup qb to fuel national title run do they remember what Tim Tebow was doing? That's what I was about to say. Is this a is this a get him in there and run the football role? No, that's literally what the article talked about. You're it shitting was, me. It said that I got to pull up the article now and read it to you because yeah, it literally talks about how Arch Manning is a better athlete than what people think. Arch Manning has decent size to where he could be a viable run option for them at the quarterback position. Yeah, no, nah, fam. If I'm a uh, what's his name, uh, old buddy that broke his back. If I'm Cooper Manning and this is my son. I am calling Texas saying, uh, what in the hell Don't are you, you thinking about? Don't you dare. Huh? Yeah. What, what, or what on earth am I reading in the headlines right now? Um, he is not going to be going out there being a guaranteed Wildcat quarterback running style in the red zone type shit. Are you, get out of here. So it's put in bold. Like it's a section of the article that says, <laughs> use Manning as a rushing compliment. Manning is not a true dual threat quarterback referring to deal from the pocket. Regardless, he boasts a more dynamic athletic profile than his famous uncles, Peyton and Eli. Not really saying much right there, but yeah, that's wild to me. I when when you first sent it to me, I thought they were gonna like, you know, just run him out there as an additional quarterback, and and my first thought process was is like that is a horrible idea. There's a, there's a no win situation for Quinn Ewers at all. Yeah, like there's no way that goes well for Quinn. Period. Point blank. I agree with that. And then what was the best part about the article was it talks about putting him in this Tebow style role. But when we're describing Arch Manning as a like somewhat of a dual threat quarterback, they said he's not a quarterback that's going to seek contact while running the ball, but he can pick up some yards for you. Tebow role for sure. Yeah. Tebow role that makes, for sure. That makes absolutely no sense to me. Arch Manning was brought in to Texas and hailed as one of the, the best prospects ever because of his starting abilities, his decision making. And oh, by the way, he's a Manning. He's like quarterback royalty. Not once was he could, like uh, renowned for his rushing abilities. Yeah, we saw what he could do against like Timmy's and, Timmy. Timmy's and Billy's yeah. and, and, and when he scrambled. But even then, it wasn't like, wow, that looks impressive. Yeah, Tim Tebow and Manning, not ever something I thought I would see linked. You know what I heard the other day? What? From somebody I trust in the quarterback world hmm. that Manning's going to do the sitting this year, right? And then start at Texas for three years. Three years? He's going to spend five years in college. Who said that, that? That's the, that's the feeling. I obviously can't tell you who said that. I can tell you after the show. Fair enough. First but day. I can't tell you dumb, right now who dumb, said that. Dumb question. My bad. Um, but, the, but no, it's okay, like, intern. But here, here was the thought process. 
A, he's definitely staying for two because they want him developed. Yeah. Uh, B, he's going to make like $10 million a year. That's all. That's I mean, that's also the thing. Starter. Yeah, you are the NIL cash cow. Like you saw like yeah. the famous picture of Quinn Ewers last year where they're interviewing him and then off to the side is 20 people with Arch Manning. Like it makes sense. Like you are going to get like a perennial first round signing bonus every time you play in college this year. So Is Arch Manning going to be like the first like – real example of seeing just how far your name can take you yeah the first real name like image actual play. yeah well that and then also like once he actually does start playing like this isn't to say that he's going to come in and start and crap the bed or anything like that or play mediocre but like say he did like he just puts up some average numbers like we would get to see like just how much having manning attached to your name means to you for like awards recognition people talking about you things like that oh buddy there would be some victory laps on that ranking coming out yeah I mean, like, no, I'm not going to say that. (laughs) What do you think he's mid? I don't think he's, I don't think, I don't think Arch Manning's a bad quarterback. I think Arch Manning is a very, very good quarterback. I think if Arch Manning was named Arch Smith, this hype would not be around him. Well, yeah. Arch Duke Ferdinand. But part of the, yeah. Part of the, the reason he's as highly allotted by college football coaches is because of the, the pedigree does matter yeah. at that position because he, I guarantee he's been having high level football conversations since he was six. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So he, I guarantee he sees it and calls it and reads it probably better than anybody his age. So it does matter. Absolutely. You know, and he, and he knows how to, you know, carry himself like a quarterback, all that stuff, even though he kept losing his ID on, on Texas's campus. Was that fake news? What was it? When no, he first I, got, when he no, first got to campus, that. people were like finding his, School ID on the ground. Oh, dude, I don't think yeah. that was fake. No. My favorite was the, him on the bird, and he's like squatting on it, looking like a, a dork riding the scooter around. <laughs> <laughs> would you? I, I would imagine sometimes you feel like you're in a glass house when you're Arch Manning. Mm. You know, people always staring at you, looking at you, watching you, making fun of your tweets, even though he doesn't tweet. But Dylan Riola sure does. <laughs> That's a good transition. That's a transition there right there. That right now, I'm here. cooking. Uh, Dylan Raiola was on Bustin' with the Boys uh, recently. And, you know, they, they, they're they doing a little tour. Like, everybody seems to be doing a tour. Mm-hmm. We're going to do a tour of our own, but it ain't going to have nothing to do with going out and creating content. Um, but anyways, <laughs> Bustin' with the Boys is up there at Nebraska as your boy clears his throat. And uh, they had all the Nebraska folk on. Of course, they had Dylan Raiola on as well. And Raiola was asked – about his poem. Now I don't have the poem in front of me. I wish oh, I, I could did. get it pulled up real quick. Um, get that pulled up for me. Uh, but he was asked about his poem that he announced his commitment with, um, that everybody on the internet thought was written by Chat GPT. What if I told you that the Riola family actually paid someone to write that poem, or actually had someone write that poem? I don't know if the 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 money was exchanged. Are you wanting me to read this? I mean, if you want to read this, go for it. Okay. Just as a refresher to everybody. In the realm of college dreams where purpose takes flight, enter Dylan Rayola crafting his narrative in the night. Once lured by Georgia where powerhouse glory gleamed, yet Nebraska's purpose in his heart brightly beamed. In the scarlet and cream where legacies entwine, Dylan, like Rogers, Rozier, and Crouch, a hero in line. No longer a cog in some powerhouse machine, but a quarterback with an even grander ambition unseen. So fellow fans await with hope in the air for Dylan to choose his purpose to declare. In a weakened decision, destiny calls to fulfill his purpose where a new dynasty enthralls. That reads like Bro, the who, night before Christmas. Well, it was released around Christmas the, time. It was. The three... The three names they rattled off in like one name, I don't, I don't. Give me those again. I don't know them. Oh shoot! I just I don't know all it. of them. I I know Crouch and um, I do. Know, I know Crouch and the other one, Rogier. I don't know him. Rogers, Rogier, and Crouch. I know Crouch and I know Rogers. Uh, Mike oh. Rogier, the running back. Mike Rogier. Yeah. So he went. He went two quarterbacks and a running back. Attaboy. As their legends. Okay. Um, but anyways, apparently they didn't write it. He didn't write it. Chat GPT didn't write it. A ghostwriter wrote it. Mm. And uh, the parents got him to do it. Does that obviously, it change anything? Obviously, they're asked? saying this to kind of get like the pressure off his back. Like, oh, Dylan Raiola didn't write this. Does that make it any better that like, hey, 
We need this fire ass poem. Let's call <laughs> someone up so we can get this and announce that we're going to Nebraska. Bro, I ain't even gonna lie to you. And I think this is what I talked about when this poem came out. I didn't even I didn't even make fun of the poem as much as I did the 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 decisions that the public relations department of the Dylan Riola camp has made it just haven't been great. They have not handled everything with um, my par- my parents played in the league for twelve years. You know, yeah. Like most most parents that played around the NFL for a decade, decade and a half. Most parents and, and kids who have access to like I don't know Matt Stafford or have like representation, which he does, right? Most of these people have people around them who make really, really good and sound decisions around the public relations management of your upbringing or of your decision-making process or just something as simple as like how news gets out. Most of these things are really, really well-crafted and like well-managed and taken care of because they don't they don't want bad. It's not, this is bad PR. It's just like, buddy, people, people laughed at you for a while and then you had to go on a really popular podcast and say that you know your, your parents had someone write it for you just probably not a good idea to bring it up again at all in my yeah opinion. which I, I guarantee you he has not i yeah. guarantee you everything that has been asked about this has been brought to him yeah which again that, that's not on the kid that's on the public relations team i'm not putting on mom or dad i'm putting on whoever the hell is around this kid that's supposed to be managing his image because god forbid your, your team's large i know it is you better have a brand representation manager or a brand manager or somebody who's out here looking out for you you know what i mean yeah absolutely yes. we good a good laugh yeah for those so. of you who just joined us, Jade Rashada, indeed in the portal. Maybe we'll take a look at the high school tape here coming up on the local hour because it sounds like Georgia is the lead candidate to land him. Welcome in to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? Let's shut up and grab some tape. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome into the Film Guy Network. Uh, we got a lot of stuff going on right now. We got our boy Kirby over there writing a report. We got our boy Jay Will over here handling all things stream related. Uh, it's a wild time to be here on the Film Guy Network. Glad you guys are here with us today. Make sure you're hitting the thumbs up button. Make sure you're liking, subscribing, rating, reviewing. If you missed any portion of tonight's broadcast, we are made readily available for you guys. However, wherever you catch out your podcast, over on whether it be Spotify, Apple, Apple, all that good stuff. So what we're going to do here is instead of talking about Ryan Montgomery, instead of going to the film evaluations and doing all that, I'm going to allow Kirby to breathe for a little bit, write that article, and we're going to talk about my spring tour coming up right now. How's that sound? Sounds great. Okay. Um, I got a list. It's a long one, about 85, 90 schools of players that Georgia here has in the state worth evaluating. Okay. Um, every spring, I try to see as many high schools as I humanly possibly can during this time for a variety of reasons. One, uh, trying to put as much exposure and limelight on uh, student athletes as I possibly can here in the state. Uh, Two, trying to get well acquainted with what and who and why Georgia's recruiting who they are here in the state. Uh, Trying to develop as many relationships with high school football coaches as I possibly can. Trying to put my face in front of as many people as I possibly can. And perhaps most importantly, because it really rounds out all those relationships, trying to meet and, and talk to and, and and establish relationships with as many college football coaches as I possibly can. Okay. Um, it's a massive time for high school football, or excuse me, college football coaches. And uh, it's become something that they've limited high school football or college football coaches on nowadays. NCAA has recently put in a rule where uh, college coaches can only go to a specific school once 
okay? Can't go back to that school during the same evaluation period. So people doing things like what I'm about to do over the next week or next month, I should say, has become very, very important for these college football programs, okay? Going to see as many kids as you possibly can. So uh, today I did my schedule, I finalized it. I have 50 schools starting next Tuesday until May 17th that I will be seeing, 50. That's a lot. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, so if there are any uh, any sponsorship opportunities that people want to get into, I'm all for it. I'm going to be all over this state. People are going to see me from Rome all the way down to Savannah, all the way over to Thomas County, all the way up to Columbus, okay, everywhere up, uh, across this great state of Georgia, your boy will be, okay? We could do a uh, off-brand Brooks's – Diners, drive-ins, and dives. Yeah, honestly, I was thinking about doing some just general vlogging stuff. Yeah, while I do this, um, but it's hard. It's hard to do. Yeah, the and, I, and you know, and I'm not a great video editor, but I'm good. I'm decent at it. I'm good enough to patch clips together. Um, but anyways, uh, I, I got some players that I'm really excited to see. You want to hear them? I do want to hear them. Okay. Uh, Thomas Blackshear at Calvary Day, the wide receiver. I'm super intrigued to see. Saw him last year play against, uh, I think it was Lake Shore down there in, in real, real South Georgia, Nat country. Okay. Um, but super excited to see him, you know, kind of actually get to play football during that game against Lake Shore. I'm pretty sure they ran the ball like 45 times because they were. They're going to win that game no matter what. They just had a much, much better roster. Uh, super excited to see Elias Williams mm. down at Camden County play some football. And not on a Friday night because you watch Camden County football last several years on Friday night, you're not going to see Elias Williams. You know, they're running wishbone. He's a tight end, plays edge rusher like – you weren't going to see seven much last year. In spring practice, I would imagine I'd get to see him do some freaky shit. So that would be pretty cool. So i get to see that. Um, he's not a Georgia player, and he's not going to go to Georgia. But I'm super intrigued by Duke Johnson mm. at Dodge County. Um, don't know what it looks like in pads. I've seen it several – bless you, by the way. I've seen it several years in a row in the camp circuit, and it's freaky as shit in the camp circuit. I mean, he looks really big, really tall, really long. Um, so super excited to see that one. Uh, two guys. Now, there's five names that I'm evaluating at Douglas County, but there's two names at D.C. that I'm super intrigued about and love as football players. One is Aaron Gregory, hybrid wide receiver slash like safety football player. And the other one is Jordan Carter, mm -hmm. who I'm not going to say I discovered – but on this trail, on this tour last year, I tweeted Jordan Carter and said with a photo of him and said, "This kid will be a Power Five commit within however long. Yeah. Like he will be a Power Five national name to know within three months. He had a Georgia offer. Within three months, he had the whole SEC. So, super excited to return. And like I know what Jordan Carter is, but I'm excited to go watch him practice because I don't know if I will see a player on this list that practices harder. So super excited to see that one. Uh, empty sheet right there on that one. Uh, Cal Faulkner. Oh, Cal Faulkner, a name I'm intrigued about, a name George is intrigued about. Uh, up there at Lumpkin County. Could be one of the first schools I see. He's a heck of a basketball player. Is he? Heck of a hooper. Okay, so they're really going the Ladd McConkey route here. Uh, I, I've yeah. I mean, I know all about his basketball stuff. I yeah. can tell you that much. He's a he's a heck of an athlete. All right. So the very next day, I'm going down to Manchester to see Justice Terry. Excited about that one. Zayden Walker mm -hmm. probably gonna be the last athlete I see. I think I'm gonna skip all of the good spring games on the 17th just to go watch Zayden Walker. I hadn't seen him since he was a sophomore. Yeah, in a state title game and pouring down rain. So. Now, this one. This kid's blown up basically since Georgia let everybody know they liked him. Uh, it's Todd Robinson, a quarterback technically down at Valdosta. He's got offers from every SEC school now, and no one knows where they're going to play him. They just know he's a dude. 6'1", I think he just ran 10'7", 8", at 205 pounds. And uh, Quadzilla, real thick lowers 
on my man Todd. So, yeah, that's kind of the list of, uh, of football players. I'm really, really intrigued to see. Uh, chat's hitting on some good ones. Laganza Hayward, the uh, safety from Toombs County. Uh, sounds like Tennessee leads there, but I'm going to go see anyways um, and find out because sounds like he's a really good football player. Tape says he's a great football player. Testing measurables aren't quite there as the film says that they are. Mm. Now, I know that you usually have a couple of these every single time you do one of these tours. Like, who are you going out of your way to go see? Like, you're going to take the five-hour trip or yeah. whatever. You're going to do the thing because you have to go see this player. Uh, basically, anybody in Dodge, Appling, and uh, that, like, southeast middle Georgia run on I-16. Mm. Like, I, I want to go see those schools because I don't see them very often. Yeah. Um, but there, there's – honestly, there's not, like, one specific player – that I have on the list so far that I'm like, man, that one's really piquing my interest. Um, may, maybe the tight end from McIntosh, honestly, just committed to uh, just committed to Auburn recently. But I, I, I like what I'm hearing from SEC schools that I didn't necessarily see when I evaluated him personally. Um, his name is Hollis Davidson, big big six six, two hundred and fifty pound. Tight end out of, out of of all places, Macintosh High School. Hmm. I think Macintosh High School's put out a Power Five football player in twenty years, hmm. and they got two on this list <laughs> that I'm going to go see. So, yeah, super excited about the trip. Every year, I learn more and more. Not. <clears throat> excuse me not only about like who Georgia likes, what Georgia likes, why they like them, but I also learn a whole hell of a lot more about the state. You know, and, and who's available and, and what players I like more than the rest of the, the, the schools and, and things like that. Well, and you get to stumble on some players that aren't on the list and you show up and you're like, who the yeah, heck is this? That's perhaps my favorite part because those guys don't end up at Georgia, but those guys get to get out of their hometowns and go mm -hmm. play college football. Yeah. All because, you know, not all because of me. It's it's because they're, they're extremely gifted. But me playing a role in them being discovered – is an extremely, extremely joyful moment for me. Yeah, so, for sure. That is why we do it, even though, God, it's going to cost me an arm and leg. So seriously, uh, I don't care if I'm rolling down the highway looking like a god dang NASCAR, okay? I will put magnets on the truck. If you want to get advertised all across the state, uh, feel free to get slapped on that Toyota Tundra we got sitting in the driveway, okay? Uh, so, yeah, dead serious about that one. If you if you want to get involved, um, let me know, okay? Because we're going to get put in front of a bunch of people, okay, thousands and thousands of people uh, very, very soon. So, speaking of thousands of people, shouts out to you lovely people for being here today. Um, are we almost done with that one? Yep. Mm -hmm. All Finishing right. Finishing up right now. Finishing up right now. Let's talk about Ryan Montgomery. Just committed to the University of Georgia yesterday. Uh, I want to kind of just briefly talk about the overview and kind of catch you guys up to date of where we are um, with this process in the 2025 class. Okay, Ryan Montgomery was one of like three like big names on the board. The, the board is much longer than that, as every position group is, but they had priorities and like a group that kind of separated themselves from the rest. Those three people being Zollers. Uh, Matt Zollers just committed to Missouri two weeks ago. Uh, Julian Lewis and Ryan Montgomery. Okay, Ryan Montgomery of the three, from my understanding, has been calling Georgia wanting to get into this class for quite some time. Okay, basically since like January, it sounds like Ryan Montgomery has been wanting to be a Georgia Bulldog. Now, the question has always been, is Georgia going to open their doors and take Ryan Montgomery or is Georgia going to take a Zolers or are they going to, you know, continue to pursue a guy like Julian Lewis, right? Those have been kind of the discussions that have been having to been had inside the building. Zolers obviously goes to Missouri for what we believe to be a ridiculous amount of money. Okay. It sounds like the Julian Lewis uh, fair market value is a lot higher, considerably higher than what Georgia is going to be willing to pay at that position, which leaves Ryan Montgomery. So you at Georgia, and I, I don't want to do who's better, where's who's this, who's that, because honestly, I think if I've learned anything about the quarterback position, 
obviously have an opinion, but the hit rate on these things is so daggum low and so daggum random that you're better off just taking the guy who wants to be there and who's got really good physical traits, who, by the way, all three of those guys have really, really good physical traits. I wouldn't say Ryan Montgomery has an A-plus in any of the physical categories, but he ain't worse than an A-minus in anything. Okay, so you got a 91 overall grade across the board for a player who doesn't cost an arm and a leg and who is dying to be at your university. So whether or not you're looking at this as your opinion of whether or not you got the best player, bottom line is you got a player who is affordable and a player who wants to be there and a player you didn't have to stretch or or move your budget around to make happen. So with that being said, let's head over to the board and let's grind some tape. Love it. Will you do me a favor and tweet out that report from my account yes. over here? Okay. All right. Here we go. Now, we have already done this. We have watched Ryan Montgomery tape, but I want to watch it again because I feel like sometimes you guys got the retention span of a daggum four-year-old. So, here we go. We're going to watch it again, and I want to preface this with saying uh, this is a four-year starter, boys and girls. This is a guy who walked in as a freshman at Finlay High School. Most famous NFL athlete from Finlay High School is... Ben Roethlisberger. Hey, that boy got it. Ben Roethlisberger. Okay, he's been reading them Georgia articles lately. Uh, anyways, most famous athlete from Finlay High School, Ben Roethlisberger, is where this cat's from. Started as a true freshman, and boys, as he has matured at this school, they have given him more and more and more and more to the point where last year they were completely empty. I believe he told me 90% of snaps. Okay, so every snap we're going to see today is them out of empty saying, all right, Montgomery's got to win us the game. They went eight and three. So that's not, not bad. bad. Not bad. All right, here we go. Let's take a look. Uh, I think one thing that's going to stand out is a feel for the position, a feel for the pocket, and some deadly, deadly accuracy from this young man. Uh, feels and looks bigger than he is listed. This is a guy who's listed at 6'3", 220. He looks to me to be uh, north of 6'4 every time I see him. He seems like a big physical kid, okay? Good, quick, efficient stroke, too. Not a lot of movement in it. Not a lot of inefficiencies. You giggling? No comment. What was you giggling about, fam? Good, quick stroke. Next question, please. Okay. Uh, back to empty there. Okay, but now nah, when I watch him, guys, I see a guy who's like really, really confident in his drops, really, really mm -hmm. confident in his reads, uh, confident in the pocket awareness as well. Uh, but now nah, I'm a fan of the quick stroke, dude. I, I yeah. don't want no elongated, uh, takes forever, guys getting a bunch of read on you. I want you in and out of that thing. The thing that impresses me most just from watching this a handful of times is he's not afraid to step up in the pocket. Mm -mm. Throws through the smoke. He's, he doesn't mind throwing it in a muddy pocket at all, mm. which a lot of guys, it's like they're afraid to get their feet stepped on or something like that. Like, I think this one play here, it gets pretty crowded, this next play. There's one play on the goal line where he, he gets pressure in his face, slides back just a little bit, resets his feet, and rips one. Yeah, it's this one. This next one. That right ball's – he's floating left right there yeah. and throws a dig back across his body to the right. Yeah, people don't understand how impressive of a throw that is. And he does so really calmly. The right tackle is yeah. getting cooked on a speed rush, and he feels it immediately. First play, not out of empty. That is a dot in the wow. red zone. That's a great ball. That's just tremendous play recognition as well, understanding that he's got uh, nobody in the middle of the field with man coverage, right? This safety over here, this safety over here on the hash completely bailed out and is running this way. I got a linebacker in trail with a tremendous amount of grass to throw this football to. That's a great decision. And an even better football. I mean, some of these guys, like, in the last couple of years, you've taken football players that, you know, might have been two or three-year starters in high school or didn't start playing football until high school, like Dylan Riola. This is a guy that's going to come into college and have seen pretty much everything. You know what I mean? From his freshman year where they're not exactly running like an air raid, they're kind of doing a balanced offense, to now, you know, his junior and senior year where he's he's getting asked to throw it 45 times a game. But he didn't start playing until eighth grade, right? I believe so. Yeah. But, but it's started all four years. Correct. Will have started all four years. Correct. And there you see the athleticism. Mm -hmm. This is a hooper too. J. Will, you're you're my hooper. Uh, I tried finding, you tried it, finding it. He had, he had some highlights posted on his Twitter, but it was very much so like I was a freshman playing 
basketball at the time. So he had some uh, – his pops had posted some – I think he made all region. Mm. Okay, so he must be somewhat of a hooper. But pops was showing some of that – He's some smooth that, with it. Some of that low block work. Very you know smooth. what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't none of that. No, I didn't see any of that. It wasn't George McIntyre. No. You know what I mean? George McIntyre high school highlight tape looked like he got a strong dap game. You know what I mean? Like This high school highlight tape looked like uh, he played for Finlay, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is eight and a half minutes long. You know, you complete 68% of your balls out of empty, you're probably pretty accurate, you would imagine, right? Holy hell. Yeah, he layered the piss out of that football. Right over the hook curl drop. And look, man, this is this is kind of like part of my point about why I think the the Chuchos, uh boy wonder Aaron Murray needs to give some smoke for me because this is my whole theory about r- r- like scouting, right? Like any Yahoo with a Chooch can stand there and rip that ball. Like I promise you, you you let me get my feet in the ground, I will throw that ball and make that thing tight. It'll come out of my hand looking great, and that's awesome. But guess what? That ball gets tipped or picked by number two right there. In order to throw this football, by the way, on time, left hash, or excuse me, right hash, right hash, okay? In order to throw this football on time, he had to layer this thing. He had to be thrown with touch in between three defenders. That That's quarterback play, guys. That's translatable quarterback play. That's good. Oh, my God, yeah, dude. He took a shot. That's, that's one you're the one I was about. talking about. Dude, he stood up in the pocket and then took a shot off the face and through this, uh, what is this, a little out route? Mm. Oh, my God. Threw it high over the, the corner sinking in, too. That's some gnarly shit right there, Ryan Montgomery. That was our first normal, just standard three-step, like, slant. Another layered football. Jeez. That ball is thrown man. up over number one defender. Mm. We didn't get this deep last time, did we? No. No. Oh. So I'll go, I'll go to Nassus while the tape's rolling. Why does a guy like this only have four stars if the tape is so impressive? Is it measurables? Is it no? It's the, it's the lack of A plus traits, like I was telling you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I would say also the fact of you have Bryce Underwood and you have Julian Lewis in this class as yeah. well. So it's it's tough to have. You can you can only have so many five stars, you know. And just to be honest, like the Zoller's kid, if you watched him in person, his arm's gonna feel livier and twitchier than this kid's. Yeah. But I, I mean, I'm with yeah, you. Near 30 yard throw. Hold you know, because he's six three. He's not six five. He's a four eight runner. He's not a four six eight runner. Yeah, gotcha. He's got you know a minus arm talent, not a plus arm talent. I would say the only a plus trait I see is decision making and accuracy, which might be the most too important position yeah. traits. Like, but when it comes, to, I guess just the way I view the quarterback position is different. Like, if you have a guy that can make all the necessary throws. But he's got winning traits. Is that not more valuable than a guy who has a rocket launcher on his arm and is a, a four or five runner and super athletic and things such as that? I would push back in this sense right here, right? And here's how coaches think about this a lot of the times. I can coach all those things you're talking about right now. I can never coach a kid to be six five or run a four five. That's the the things that God gave that individual, I can never take out of that and teach to Johnny who doesn't have those things. You know what I mean? It's 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 why you know Stetson had to pl- like literally play his way into playing time. He had to prove over and over again that he was better than the guys who have more traits. Okay, um, if you're asking for a player comp on this one, I would say this is ninety. Like ceiling of this is like ninety to ninety five percent of Carson Beck. The floor of this looks to me like a college Kirk Cousins. Mm. That, that's where I'm at on this eval. Okay. I think this is a what we in the scouting world would term a ground rule double. We took a nice easy cut at it. We hit it square into the gap, bounced once, went over the, the monster. Right. This is not a, a daddy hack. Like a daddy hack would be like Ryan Puglisi. That is traits galore. We love the intangibles on the kid. Will it hit? Because if it hits, my God, he might be Josh Allen, right? Yeah. But if it doesn't, it just doesn't. You know what I mean? But I, I would lean more towards it's going to hit. <clears throat> so there we go. All right. So the very logical transition, the chat's not already there. The very logical transition would be to talk about how this impacts their recruitment for Julian Lewis, right? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> 
I don't think Julian Lewis is coming to Georgia. Uh, I, I don't think Julian Lewis is is going to go to a class with two kids in it, um, particularly two like really good ones. Okay, not that he's fearful of competition, but he is seeking playing time at least after the first year. So, um, but I think the the more important aspect of why Julian Lewis probably won't end up at Georgia, even though I think Georgia continues to recruit him uh, and he'll probably continue to listen. I think the primary reason he won't end up at Georgia is just because when when the market value is X and you are only willing to pay maybe like maybe half of X, you're going to have to overcome a lot. Okay, overcome a lot. And they just... I don't know if they were willing to wait around and overcome a lot. Something that I'm going to talk about in our next segment with the Arch Manning theory that I have going on right now. So um, there's that. I, I think the 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 place to look for Julian right now, if I had to guess, were to be to stay at USC, which it's extremely safe. Okay, they're going to pay you fair market value by everything we've heard out of there. Um, by the way, USC checks aren't bouncing; they're reneging on offers. Mm. So they're just they're just like, oh, you're not as good as what we were thought. Give me my money back. They have the money. They're just not giving it to kids that they told they were going to give to. So it is what it is. Um, but anyways, so not a bouncing check situation. Uh, where were we at? Um, really safe decision. It would be to go out there to USC. You know Lincoln Riley is going to develop you. You know, um, you know you're going to get paid fair market value out there. The other option, I would imagine at this point, from everything I've heard, sounds to be like Colorado. Hmm. Um, Colorado's offense coordinator, Pat Shermer, has NFL experience. They apparently really, really like the offense that they run out there. And, of course, once Shadur leaves, it would be the Julian Lewis show. And, and if you're looking for a show, you know what I mean, if you're looking to be talked about, you you would go there. Oh, absolutely. From a, from a brand management standpoint, like hard to disagree with the decision to go out there and be in front of a camera every day. Yeah, I mean, it's it may not be as safe as like a USC in regards to like, you know, for a fact, you're going to get developed here, there, and there, but it's safe in the sense of you're going to be the guy there. You're probably, you're going to put up numbers because Shadur has been able to put up numbers there and like people are going to talk about you. You're going to get your recognition and you're going to absolutely stay relevant at Colorado. Not that Juju is looking to stay relevant or that he needs to stay relevant, but I mean, he's he, it be, it's a viable option. I could understand why you would want to go there. Yeah, I mean, Juju and Prime together, it's going to bring so oh, much. Geez. It's going to be. Oof. It would be. Yeah. Um, I still think if I were a betting man today, I would say he ends up at USC and he ends up winning a Heisman out there. Probably. You know, I mean, he, he is going to be good. The Lincoln Riley special. Um, one of the safest evals for me as a quarterback that I've ever done. Because everything about that guy is about decision making inside the pocket and accuracy, and if you could do those two things at an elite level, yeah, I don't, I don't care about anything else. I know you're going to be really, really good wherever you go. Uh, so yeah, I, I think you know it's it's going to end up well for pretty much all involved right there. I think Georgia got their guy um, and avoided doing something that they did in 2023, which I want to talk about now. The reason, in my opinion, that Georgia has been, and I don't even think this is opinion, I think this is an opinion that is a fact, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and here's what it is. In 2023, very early on in the process, Georgia was recruiting a bunch of quarterbacks, okay? Very early in the cycle, Arch Manning was number one, and then there was a bunch of names that they liked, that Todd Munkin liked, right? Uh, whether it be Dylan Lonergan, whether it be Chase Vizina, whether it be Austin Novosad, whether it be Marcel Reed, the cat out of Tennessee that ended up going to Texas A&M, whoever it is, they had a bunch of guys on their board that they really, really liked, as they do every single class, okay? But there came a point in that recruitment where the whole building was like, hey, guys, we, we have a legitimate shot at Arch Manning. Whether they they were right to believe that or whatever, they had a thought and a theory that we have a chance to go land Arch Manning, who we love. He is our number one quarterback on our board. So here's what we're going to do, boys. We're pushing all of our chips in on Arch Manning. We're going to do something that we never do. We're only going to recruit this guy. Even if it costs us punting on the entire class in December, we're going to do it. So now you look up and it's 2024 and we're two cycles removed from that class 
and Georgia's hunting a fourth scholarship quarterback in, a, in their quarterback room. Okay, and there's a bunch of schools out here that are having to do this, whether it be because they lost their third stringer to the portal or whether their backup hit the portal or whoever it is. There are a lot of teams out here that are below their threshold at the quarterback position, but going all in on Arch made you play catch up for now 24 months. And we're going to go on 36 months. Well, we're not anymore because Jaden Rashada just hit the portal. But had the portal gone dry, Georgia would have been in a situation where they're entering the college football season with three scholarship quarterbacks, something that he's been on the record talking about not wanting to do. So what I think happened, boys, I think they learned a very obvious lesson from Arch Manning, a lesson that I don't think they will stray away from moving forward. We will not, by any means necessary, go quote-unquote all in on any quarterback moving forward. Don't care who he is, what he is, whatever. We will recruit the position like we recruit every other position, which is we are trying to get the best players available, period, no matter who it is. I mean, yeah, you've kind of found out how quickly things can change for you at the quarterback position because at the time – it was like, well, it may not be the end of the world if Georgia doesn't end up with a quarterback this class because we still have Carson Beck, we still have Brock Vandergrove, we still have Gunnar Stockton. Like, it was still a pretty loaded quarterback room that you thought it'll remain constant and we can maybe find someone in the portal, whatnot. And then you get to this offseason, and that's when you really felt the effects of it. And you it quickly changed. I mean, once Brock Vandergrove was gone, I was like, oh crap, like we're all of a sudden not as deep as we were all of a, uh, at the quarterback position. Yeah, I feel like they would have been okay had Brock Vandergriff stayed, obviously, but you can't expect that out of a guy who has that much talent and could go and start at a Kentucky, per se. Like, you always had to figure, like, if Brock Vandergriff doesn't win the starting job, he's going to leave eventually. And I do think that's that's part of the reason why Georgia had to play catch-up. I mean, it's why they were going to take two quarterbacks in the 24 class. My question is, do you think that as a, par- as a way to kind of – sure they're caught up they might take to this class or is is montgomery the one and only guy yeah if rashada ends up there by june they don't take another kid that's true i, I, I guess transfers now, what do they, factor in i here. mean rashada has a chance to be the real like future you know him and gunner will compete you would imagine in the fall yeah. of 20 or in the spring of 2025 come march if he ends up here um and I, I wouldn't even know who I would favor in that. In that, <laughs> you know, I really don't. Not yeah. yet. Um, Wait, I mean, it's way too early. One of them's got college tape, though. And I'm gonna tell you what Rashada put on tape, at least in my opinion, especially like his first game, was like real electric shit. Got the high school tape if you want. Got the high school tape. Yeah. Let's go watch it just for shiggles. I love shiggles. Um, also, by the way, see some comments in the chat. I know it's in the title. Uh, Sam and Pimba was trolling. A really goofy troll. If yeah, wait. You ask me. Do you want me to go ahead and read the uh, the updated? Yeah, read me the update. So he he tweeted or he Instagrammed a bunch of Georgia photos, and it just said thanks UGA dot dot dot. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we had going on. Yeah. So the original post was thank you UGA dot dot dot. And there's a bunch of pictures of him obviously playing. Since then, he's added something to the caption. Thank you UGA dot dot dot. In parentheses, I'm not leaving. So he's staying. Wasn't it, I'm not sliding at yeah, first. Yeah, I'm not sliding. I'm not, it first said, I, yeah, he's updated it again. He's updated it again. It first said, I'm not sliding. It now says, I'm not leaving. Oh. So this is the third update to reassure Georgia fans he's not leaving. <laughs> boy. Gotta love boy, college kids. Man. Boy, there were some interesting phone calls before the show. We're, we're just like running around like chickens with our head cut off. Like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> and that's exactly what the building was saying. The building's like, I don't fucking know. What is this news to us? About? Yeah, and then got a text message. He's trolling. Um, you think he runs for that? I don't you know. You can make a kid run for something like that, you know? He's trolling your fan base, man. He's probably I mean, getting... Actually, I take that back. I, I think you could just for saying, thank you for wasting my time and having to answer phone calls because you wanted to troll on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he's definitely getting an ass chew. All right, let's take a look at this highlight tape. This is Jaden Rashada's high school tape. Uh, and this this looks like what he did at Arizona State, just throw nukes. I think this is a junior film, too. Is he out of Arizona? California. California. His... Pittsburgh, California. Nice. In his three game appearances, mm. he threw for 44 or 82 attempts, 44 completions for four touchdowns and three interceptions. So it's like 52%? Yeah. It's uh, 53.7. Hmm. Good Lord. Yeah, bro. He's got some damn life. Mm. He throws a great deep ball. 
This is a scrimmage. Yeah. Yeah, it is. He's got good West Coast mechanics. Uh, slams onto his front side really, really well. Okay. You won't see him leaning over his left leg at all. <clears throat> Even that ball, he squatted oh. down. Yeah. He's got, he's got insane juice. Okay. That ball is extremely tight, too. I don't know if you can see that. But standing this close to the film, I can tell. Not a wobbler one. Good back shoulder ball against cover two right there, it looked like. Field fade. you going to be Damn. throwing those a lot of Georgia. That's a great catch, though. Yeah. You like to see juice and then also the ability to put touch on yeah, it. Yeah, I, I want to see you have some life and some layering. You're right. Mm. Really thin athlete, though. Okay. Yeah. Really, really thin athlete. He's going to have to put some weight on. Got kind of a uh, Jaden Daniels build. Yeah. I, think. I can see that. Yeah. I can see that a lot. Ironically. Yeah. Number five transfer from Arizona State. Yeah. I wonder where the comp came from. So I much, do that a lot. So much irony, dude. I'm wearing an Arizona State jersey today. And shout out, Pat Tillman. Shout out, Pat. Is that Jake Plummer, Rose Bowl days? Yeah, that was when they yeah. played uh, TC. Jake uh, the Snake. Who did they play in the road? Damn. Year? They got killed. Did you see that ball? No, nah, go again. Watch this one. This ball is a scud. On the run, too? Oh, Lord. Yeah, Jeez. Yeah, but he got one of them ones. Dot. How much does he weigh now? Because this was two, two, two. I bet he's 6'3", 185. Yeah, I mean, he's 17 years old in this video. But I'm telling you, he ain't got much bigger. And he's had some uh, he had some lower body injuries out there at Arizona had State. Had knee surgery, and then he hurt his thumb during the spring. Knee surgery? I believe so. ACL or what? Let me see if I can find it. Thanks. What? They have him listed as 6'4", 185. That's what I said, 6'3", 185. But he's 6'4", so I was wrong. But I was right. Um, sounds like it's Georgia. I, I, very rarely do you see all those connective tweets. I mean, that's the phone call I got. All I got was, yes. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you don't see Twitter right now? And I'm like, I'm a little busy. But what are you talking about? He's like, the Rashada stuff. Well, you know, we'll, we'll be interested. It was funny because before the show, I was just talking about, like, you know, one thing that's different from winter and spring is that, like, in the winter, it was like, kid enters a portal, next day he commits to his school. You hadn't seen that with the spring, and then you have Jaden Rashada, who is about to enter the portal, and then, oh, Georgia, by the way, it's lead, they're leading. Yeah. It was a... Uh, He's ling- not even officially in, by the way. <laughs> no. It was a lingering knee injury, so nothing specific, uh, but probably something that just need to get cleaned up. Hmm. Well, he's going to come to Georgia and sit for a year. If, if he comes. If he comes. Let's keep talking about the ifs. That's good calls. Uh, so, if he comes to Georgia, how quickly before he's like 205? I don't know. They're gonna, next spring. Next spring? They're going to funnel food in that kid. Oh, I don't know, though. I, yeah, I guess if he got here, he'll be funneling. if he came to Georgia and he got here in June, you give him the entire summer. Hey, no joke, you know, our coach used to – well, I shouldn't say this out loud at a Baptist university in college, but our coach used to tell our offensive linemen that couldn't keep weight on, stop drinking light beer. Mm. He said, if I, basically, if I hear or catch you – hear about you drinking light beer, like, I'm, I'm going to – the opposite of run you. Nothing <laughs> but some like, Bud Diesel, baby. I'm going like to make you binge eat if I catch you drinking anything but heavy beer. Bud That's heavy, crazy. Baby. Yeah. Got to get them extra carbs, baby. Carbo load. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. this is just a hypothetical question. Jaden Rashada commits to Georgia tomorrow. He's on campus within the next few weeks for the 2024 season. Where is he on the death chart, in your opinion? Is he number three because mm-hmm. you're ahead of guy? You have college experience. Mm-hmm. Is he number two because he has college experience, unlike Gunnar Stock or more than Gunnar Stockton, who's really only appeared in a handful of games in, in garbage time? So he will slide into the depth chart at four, and then if they had to play tomorrow, he'd be the three. Okay, you would imagine because Makes Gunner's sense. been here longer. He just yeah. had assuming assuming Puglisi's fully back as well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, if if all things were healthy and all things were even right now today, he enrolled tomorrow. I would think he'd be the four on the depth chart behind Puglisi. But if they had to play on Sunday or on Saturday, 
he would get thrown into the fire third because he's actually got game time experience maybe. Um, but come the fall, I imagine he's the three. Um, again, all assuming he ends up at Georgia. Yeah. Which no other school's been linked to him. No, but we also know how quickly things can change. For sure, on that front. Um, I think the real question becomes, it will, you know, Gunner, Gunner spoke a good word when he was asked about this, right? You know, transfer portal coming in, he said Kirby's been very honest about wanting four scholarship guys, <laughs> and this is the University of Georgia, so you ought to be competing at the quarterback position. Uh, you hold him true to those words, but this can't feel good, right? Yeah, um, I think it can't feel good because, if anything, you kind of assume that maybe Georgia was going to go out and get somebody that had no college experience and was just wanting maybe to be somewhere else other than their school and just kind of get like a depth guy. But then when you hear the name Jaden Rashada come into the mix and it's someone that has already played three games at another school and is about to enter year, year two for himself, like – that has to put a little bit more pressure on yourself, and it can't feel great. It, it, it probably feels worse than what you thought it was going to be. Auburn fans wiling in the mentions on Twitter right now. Why? I posted a video of uh, Julian throwing a football. and uh, Juju? Yeah, Julian. Lewis, yes, Juju. I, I, everyone else calls him Juju. I just call him Julian. Um, but anyways, Auburn fans are commenting on it. Uh, quote, just tell us the number. We will cover it. War damn eagle. <laughs> <laughs> After going to that stadium, that's interesting. Uh, Auburn Buigel speaking for Yellowwood's money. Why, why are you speaking for Yellowwood's money? Uh, talking about his put, bread. He'll put the bread in, ba- in the back of Daddy's lifted truck and hey, ship man. it to him. Himself. As long as he's got a radiator guard, it'd be all right. You know what I mean? How many radiator guards did we count out? In oh, dude, it was like fifteen within the first mile. Before we even got to the school off the interstate, yeah. we saw like fifteen. I don't even know if we were guards. in Auburn yet, and we were counting them. Like, Just absolutely love it. It's a requirement, prerequisite to get into Auburn. Daddy's money, lifted Silverado with a, a radiator guard yeah. on the front of it. Ain't no doubt, it, and it don't even have to be like like real super redneck lifted. Just lifted enough to get some neato grapplers on it. <laughs> just lifted enough to show, like, yeah, I put an extra five grand in this truck. Just in the tires. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, couple couple inches, and uh, give me some of them neato terror grapplers. You know, so I can tear up the streets of Albarn. Anyways, what were um, we talking about before? Well, I think we were talking about the uh, the Arch Manning theory. Y'all's thoughts on on this process of I think this I think it really did play a role in this. Had the Arch Manning stuff not went the way it did, I think if it, they never had that experience, I think they look at this class and they chase Julian Lewis until the very end, and then they're like, "Oh shit, we didn't get Julian. What do we do now?" Yeah, you could have been really screwed if that were the case. That's what I'm saying. I think I think watching that happen to them with Arch because that's basically what happened, right? Yeah. Like midway through June, they were like, all right, fuck it. We're going full in, all in on this one, right? It might have been even earlier than that, but they stopped calling. They stopped calling Lonergan. They stopped calling Vazina. They stopped calling all of these quarterbacks and went solely in on Manning. He ends up going to Texas, and y'all got to the point where y'all were about to, like, take a preferred walk-on. You know what I mean? Like, y'all were just going to try to take a body or an arm in the room, ultimately kicked or punted on the whole room that class, and now you're playing catch-up. And I think it did. I think it, it might have scarred them into – not saying that Montgomery was a, a backup plan or he's a lesser-than plan, but he was the guarantee, and being guaranteed in this situation is vital. Well, here's right. my question is like, so Arch Manning committed late July that year, I believe it mm-hmm. was. Um, and so do you think that like, say Julian Lewis was not committed to USC right now, say he wasn't committed or Zoller's wasn't, or we'll say Zoller's is still committed to Missouri, but say Julian Lewis is still weighing his options. He's not committed to USC. He's still uncommitted. Do you think that Georgia still goes like says, we're going to hold on you, Montgomery. We're not going to let you come to the class yet because Julian Lewis is not committed yet. Yeah, I think I think if you're not working to flip, if you're just working to commit, it's a totally different situation. Yeah. I think flipping – because basically what it is now is an NIL commitment as well. Yeah. So you're going to have to basically like not necessarily buy them out of their current contract, but you're going to have to outbid their current contract or bid enough to make you a viable option, which I don't – again, to start the conversation there, like – and I don't. I I think I know why Julian gets it because he's the number one quarterback, or he's the five star, and he's the name, right? But like Zoller's did the very same thing. Zoller's got 
you know, put in front of him a, an offer that was almost unrefusable from Missouri. No matter how good of a job Georgia did, they were never going to go up to that number or even get really close to it, so I'm told. It's the same exact situation here going on with Julian. So from both sides' standpoint, I'm not going to take half of a pay cut just to come play for the G, and you don't want to go outside of your your comfort zone with what you're willing to spend on the market. So we're just not right for each other. You go get what's best for you, and I'm going to go get what's best for me. I think for once, like we we're getting to a situation where I think the fans are going to be okay with that. This mm-hmm. like it, had you lost Justin Fields initially out of high school you would have gotten some shit for this you're going to lose julian lewis here and everyone from a consensus standpoint as a fan base is going to be okay with it because they know the deal Mm -hmm. yeah do you think that that's something that nil has kind of benefited schools with at least a little bit oh it's at georgia it certainly eased the losses because now you can just blame it on the money you didn't blame it on losing we didn't lose that guy we got outbid yeah and i think that's kind of limited this some of the reactions that you typically would have seen in situations like this i mean there's been multiple prospects out of the state of georgia over the years of multiple Mm -hmm. positions where Georgia guy seems like he should be a Georgia guy goes somewhere else and it's yeah it's exactly what you're saying of oh well they just bid more money than us like we can't do so much about it the, well, then the conversation more so is about like well, why can't we have more money well not even to mention that I think the fact that also you've proven that you can win without necessarily the number one overall five star quarterback you can win national championships without having that guy like let's be fair Stetson Bennett was not this as a recruit oh. so I think oh. the fact that you've proven like hey we don't necessarily need this and we're not going to prioritize going out and getting this because one, we don't need to win it, and two, what's give me that? two and zoom me in. Got some, uh, got some mechanical issues going on right here. We got a ball dropper, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. Y'all see that ball dropping below the waist on Breakpoint? We got a ball dropper that's going to have to get cleaned up. You know what I mean? Bet you no other show was pointing that out. Tonight. Yeah, bet you, bet you nobody knows that he's a ball dropper. Okay, you got. There's got to be a different way you can call that. Oh, he's a ball dropper. He drops the ball at the break point. Come Watch, on, see, man. Y'all the ones with your head in the gutter. Yo. My head is on the football field. That's Yo. it. My head is on ball. That's see, it. You're dragging me with you over here now. Gosh. Just a corruptible, corruptible human right now. Dirty man. mind. I, look, all right, fine. I have a dirty mind, but I'm not the only one who has a dirty mind. I mean, he did sign at the wall, mind dirty whiskey neat. Should have known what we were getting into. That's true. I did do that, actually. I mean, the reality of the situation is I talk ball around here, and it might get a little sus every once in a while. But the facts are that still photo of him at a break point tells me he's a ball dropper, and we got to clean that up. Got to clean that up, period. Point How hard is that to fix? How long has he been doing it? Yeah, that's what I was about to ask. Because like, I know some things, like once you've been doing something for such a cooked. long time. Muscle, yeah. memory. The muscle memory, cooked. Because then you almost got to, like, do the same amount of reps again to, like, get mm-hmm. it fully, like, out of your system. And, like, I can I can watch you in on-air dry reps. I can watch you in practice all day long. The moment the bullets fly, if you feel the need to do that, then I can't – I can't take enough game reps and coach them up yeah. to fix that out of you. The only person I've ever seen really, like, truly from top to bottom fix their mechanics in the middle of a career or towards the end of their career or anywhere in the middle of their career is two people, Josh Allen and Tom Brady. Yep. And both those two humans had so much uh, uh, technology at their disposal that it made that transition much, much easier. When you can when you can biometrically track how your body's moving and it will redline what is inefficient for you, and we can do that every single time you throw the ball. Like that that's unprecedented technology that people didn't have prior to these humans. Yeah. All right, let's get a real nerdy question in here. Mm. What's the difference? Obviously there's a difference, but why is it because you've told me this before, why are you okay with if a quarterback taps before they throw, whereas it's okay to elongate? Because yeah. I feel like timing, it's not that much of a difference. No, so well, it is. There's a di- football over here. I love this. So there's there's a big difference between a tapping mechanism, which, by the way, Drew Brees was a tapper. Tom Brady was a tapper. Patrick Mahomes is a tapper. Joe Burrow is a tapper. I'm a tapper. Tap, I mean, that's just – we're literally just doing that. That that and pulling this is a total difference between this and this. We all see that, right? Mm-hmm. Tapping and dropping. When we're ball droppers, we're having to go full six all the way back up to here. Okay, as opposed to all we're really trying to do is pull our lat muscle, we're trying to get our lat to contract right there, and then rotate our hips and eventually get into lay back. 
Okay, that's all we're really trying to do. And any movement south of here is a break point. Okay, now if you're a ball dropper and all you do is ball drop to like a 90% cut right there, when we're just pulling that lat, that's fine. If you watch me, I'm, I'm like right here too. Joe Burrow is right here too. Okay, we're a little bit of a ball dropper. That's it's different like between Burrow. that and dropping all the way to our waistline. Okay, that makes sense. I just, I just figured that it's always. I always thought tapping was wasted motion. And nah, if you're if ball. you're out here coaching kids to stop tapping the football, I wish that kid would look at you and and for once just say you're not watching ball, coach. Not watching ball at all. All the good ones tap it. And I'm not saying just start tapping the ball because you you see the good ones tap it. This is a rhythm thing. It is the start of a rhythmic motion. Okay. So however you want to start that rhythm, I don't care as long as it's efficient from the start point. I mean, it's probably the same reason why you see infielders in baseball give the glove a little tap before they rocket it over to first base. Huh? I was saying it's no different than like infielders in baseball. Like they yeah. give the glove a little tap before they rock it over to first base. And obviously you can't be tap, tap, tapping, but tap, tap, tap a oh. I beat you to it. I knew you were about Dang to do it. it. Just tap it. Just give it a little tap. Send tap, the ball tap, home. Tap. Send it to it home. Why would you go in your home, ball? R.I.P. Chubbs, man. R.I.P. Chubbs. Oh, yeah. Somebody listening to our AirPods just went, ah! <laughs> Sorry about that. All them years, all them months, y'all been complaining about that audio. Fix the damn audio. <laughs> Too oh, loud. Yeah. Hold on, I gotta respond to this text here. Phone been busy lately, huh? He yeah, has. It's that it's, time of year. It's yeah. always the time. I mean, is it gonna be like this during regular season? Or should um, be like, I gotta go. Brooks, maybe. Brooks stands up and walks out. Maybe. We need to have a segment call for that. Just an emergency segment to go to where... Brooks is on the phone right now. We got to go to this real quick. That's basically what we just did. Yeah. No, I mean, you guys are good enough at this point where y'all can start riffing. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. riffing's fine, but just be like, oh, it's that time. Okay. All right. Um, right. Let's talk about these potential names in the portal. Uh, the TCU guy sounds like what we talked about in the first hour. Sounds like he wants uh, a good bit of cash and also wants to be somewhere near the Midwest. Um, then there's another name, Simeon Barrow, or maybe Barrow. He's a defensive tackle, war number eight up at Michigan State. Uh, he is from the state of Georgia and has entered the portal. I would imagine you're in some type of evaluation process or a uh, conversational process. Here's what you need to know about Georgia. If a kid enters, Georgia's evaluating him. I spoke to a source yesterday that made a joke about how he was tasked with watching 300 football players, none of which could ever dream to play at the University of Georgia. But they're getting evaluated. Like everyone's getting evaluated. So it's a really tumultuous time right now, even for, for football programs that aren't necessarily active in this transfer portal. Okay. So there's that right there. Um, but, you know, they, they needed a transfer quarterback. That was what they absolutely 100% had to go down with. Um, it sounds to me like he's going to. Uh, they're going to get it. It might not be Jaden or Shaw, but they're going to get it. Sounds like they're going to get something. Yeah. Um, question i have for you would be obviously they they had planned on taking a quarterback in the room but say you get an extra defensive lineman or you find some, another guy like you said the best available in the portal and you got for him and by some chance you land three extra guys mm. we've talked about how they're kind of at the threshold with roster scholarships is that not a problem anymore with the nil thing or is it kind of just they can they'll find room so look they're they're anywhere from 85 to maybe slightly over they have six guys coming in this summer and i think you're doing a full you're you're, you're doing a fool's game or playing a fool's game right now in the world world of college football trying to project scholarship numbers where guys are at who's on scholarship who's not uh this guy was a four-star coming out of high school that's fine he hasn't played in four years but he's still on the roster well is his scholarship getting picked up you know what I mean? Right. Is yeah. he, is, does he have a 4.3 Zell Miller and, you know, Georgia slides him an extra 20 grand a year to make sure he doesn't have to pay for school? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, that right there is probably happening, not at a really, really high clip, but it's happening. And, and here's why I'm not worried about Georgia's number, right? Georgia's number, I, th I have a good, you know, idea of where it's at. I have a good idea where they're at and what, what their number they're pinned up on. Um, but it doesn't every every five seconds it feels like it doesn't 
really matter um, because when you look at the SEC, they're not near as bad as the rest of the conference. Mm. I don't know Auburn's roster like I know Georgia's, but I know the four-star that you signed in 2020 that's still on your roster, he probably ain't going to school for free. He's not a walk-on. You know what I mean? So if you go look at the rosters and just look at the years the guys with signs, put them through a 24-7 search, you'll find out that a lot of these SEC rosters are somewhere near 95, 100 kids. Yeah. So does the 85 scholarship limit matter? I would tell you, hell no, it doesn't. I would tell you right now that even if Georgia were pinned up against this uh, mythical, mythological number, it's not going to stop them from going to get Jaden Rashada if they want Jaden Rashada. If a defensive tackle enters the transfer portal tomorrow that Georgia feels like they can both afford and land, the scholarship number will not stop them from going and getting that kid. So if that's what you're worried about, then no, it is a, it's a, a moot point at this point. Okay. I just know that we were kind of talking about earlier earlier in the offseason about how a lot of these teams are kind of at the threshold of, hey, you know, you might see a lot of unloading in this offseason, not because of players are unhappy where they are, but just because you have to do it by necessity. So just the fact that you're saying that now makes more sense that NIL is kind of, NIL is kind of really played a factor in the fact that you don't have to worry about as much of the 85 number. And even if you had to worry about the 85 number, you'll still find a way to make now, it. Now, look, starters ain't out here taking the NIL money. Yeah, yeah of course it's, not. It's still... It's still a pain in the ass if this happens to you, okay? Because what now has to happen is every month you've got to pay your own student, do your own tuition. Uh, every month you now have to – you can't go like at Georgia, the place called Bones, the the team facility mm-hmm. where you can eat. You don't get to eat that if you're on an NIL scholarship. Yeah. If you're, if you're a walk – you're technically a walk-on. The NCAA views you as a walk-on. So when you go on road trips, you do not get team dinners. Like you don't get to do that. You don't get the uh, the team issued gear. You're not supposed to. Now, is all these things stretched? Probably, I would imagine. Probably, um, like a prime example of this is if we go to a team meal. I'm on Scully. You're not. I give you my plate and go get a second plate. Guess what? We just bypassed that stupid ass rule. Mm-hmm. Okay, so well, those things like that. Can I happen. mean, it, there's a story of Jalen Carter doing that exact thing. So I mean. It's not even like if you are doing it and they find out about it, they're going to do something about it anyways. So, Honey Bunner Stockton's a random one. Yeah, there's there's been some touch and go ones in there today. Um, but yeah, that's that. I don't have any more show notes, do y'all? No, sir. Nothing else we need to talk about? We can continue to riff for 10 minutes. I mean, what I, guess, about? I guess my question is, I thought about this earlier. Say Georgia doesn't miss on Arch Manning. Say by for whatever reason they evaluate him and say we don't want this kid, or say they ended up getting him. Do you think where we sit up right now, they are probably more inclined to go all in on Julian Lewis, even though he is committed to a USC? Rephrase your question. You said if Arch Manning were on the if, roster if, right so now. So basically, if the Arch Manning situation never happened, where Georgia got burned after going all in on that, are they probably if they just took Chase or Chris Vizina that class? Sure. Yeah. Are they more inclined to go all in right now with Julian Lewis to say like because we all know that Georgia really wants this guy? Mm-hmm. Are they more inclined to say all right, throw everything at this kid? We can. We're, we're going all in on him. No, I I think the the hesitancy hesitancy to spend money at the rate that the market declares that you must to land a Julian Lewis has very little to do with Arch Manning miss, has everything to do with not compromising uh, whatever you know cultural means they have around the building. And look, Kirby has been on the record. He does not mind paying college football players. He does not. In fact, it's pretty well documented. Their quarterback's pretty well paid. You know what I mean? Their starting quarterback right now makes good money. All right. Um, but what they're kind of uh, hesitancy, hesitant about is giving unproven high school football players life changing money right now when we don't know who you are, what you're going to be. Yeah. Now, that being said, Carson's going to leave this roster in January. Everyone knows that. So does Carson's salary. Yeah. Carson's salary leaves this roster in January. So are you back in play for somebody else? You know what I mean? Like that kind mm. of deal. Unless it's just kind of a philosophy of if you're a starting quarterback at the University of Georgia, like this is what you can earn or whatnot. That's uh, maybe I don't know if that's what they would do. But you know, you know what I mean? Like Carson's salary left, but that's just gonna be instilled into whoever our next starting quarterback yeah. is. Like whoever earns that job, like that's who that money's gonna go to. Yeah, like that's yeah. set like that's a flat rate of like, hey, you're the starting quarterback, this is what you get. Think so? 
I Maybe. mean, there's I a possibility know. of that. I don't. I, obviously, I don't know how UGA runs there. Smart thing to do would be disperse it. You know what? I've had a lot of great takes on this channel. I think. I think that's why it grows. We don't have shit takes right here. We must have some decent ones. I've had a it lot of great f- takes. It fun. What are you talking about? That too. Um, my capologist take, hmm. like at the start of NIL, yeah. I had two great takes to start of NIL. One, Blue Bloods coming back. The 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 schools with the obvious donors, you ain't got to search for, far for, for them, right? Tennessee, Texas, uh, USC. The only one that I missed that ain't out here spending it that's got it is Michigan. Like Michigan's one of their biggest donors, the CEO and creator of Dell. He probably got some cash. You know what I mean? He probably got some money waiting around to go out here and buy some players. They ain't doing it. Um, but the other one was um, shit. Michigan was going to. No. <laughs> Blue Bloods. I don't know. Must not have been that good of a take. Alabama was going to box there. No, I'm just kidding. You know, somebody told me. Uh, on my softening of a football take, they told me to enjoy my CTE. I'm going to enjoy it. I just missed out on that whole take. It just went right out of my head. I don't think you have CTE. Not yet. If you do, you could go work for Antonio Brown. CTE ESPN? Yeah. yeah. Not a bad gig. You think they got bennies? You got what? Benefits. Oh. Hopefully. They don't have health insurance over CTE ESPN, do they? I don't know. Only one way to find out. Yeah, we gotta go ask <laughs> Antonio <laughs> Brown. If you're watching, Antonio Brown. If you're watching this, let us know. What, Wouldn't that be on. wild if we just got tweeted? Uh, what What is his white people of the day that he does? Yeah. <laughs> cracker of the day. Cracker, cracker of, the day. of the day. What if we were his crackers of the day? I'm sure we could figure out a way to get there. Like, I don't think I want to be. All right. Oh, capologist. That was a great take. The fact that somebody needs to have somebody handling their salary. That's the first one you gave. Yeah. And then the other one was. Um, the Blue Bloods are coming the back. The Blue Bloods are coming back. Okay. Two great takes. Okay. Yeah. Give me somebody to handle my salary. Give me somebody um, that's got all the money. Fortune 500 companies. Good recovery. Look at you. Love there you it. go. Never Love mind, it. Antonio. We don't need you. Maybe I don't have CTE because of the chat. Shouts out to the chat. Appreciate you guys. Love you. We'll see you Monday.